Hallo. Hallo. Goedenavond. Goedenavond hier, goedenavond thuis. Welkom in een bomvol carré. En vreemd is dat niet dat het hier hartstikke druk is. Want onze gast van vanavond die schreef een wereldwijde bestseller. Een boek dat president Trump tot grote razernij voortbracht. En dat is allemaal niet opmerkelijk. Wat wel opmerkelijk is, is dat de president zelf de explosieve titel voor het boek leverde. They will be met with fire and fury. Fire and Fury, dat is de titel van het boek en het is een controversieel boek. De schrijver die beweert dat Trump zich gedraagt als een kind in het Witte Huis... volkomen ongeschikt is voor de baan en die baan eigenlijk helemaal niet wilde hebben. Wie is de man achter dit boek? Samen met 1500 studenten hier in Carré in Amsterdam... vraag ik het aan de auteur en journalist uit Amerika, Michael Wolf. Take a seat. Thanks a million for coming out to Amsterdam. Wow. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Are you surprised that you are suddenly a rock star now in the nonfiction world? You know, I, and I would like to claim credit, but I think I owe the credit to uh, Donald Trump. What a lucky timing. You probably worked hard for it, but still, I mean, you need Trump to get this result, right? As an author. You, you know, I had hoped that he would, I would get a few, a few nasty tweets, but instead I got a lawsuit and a threats, and um, he went into the um, fire and fury business, so, um, so I'm, I'm grateful. Yeah. We'll talk about the book, and there are probably many questions here, but first of all, uh, we found out during our research that your mom was from the Netherlands, right? Her entire family. Hmm. What's her name? Her, her name is Marguerite van der Werf. Marguerite van der Werf. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. So do you know where she came from in the Netherlands? F uh, from Friesland. Do you, do you understand the language? Have you learned the language? No, when, I was a, when, I was a, when I was very young, my grandparents spoke to me in Dutch. So I theoretically understood them at the time, but uh, that was a very long time ago. Yeah. And also, not only is your mom Dutch, but uh, as I understood, she also was a journalist? She was. She was. Newspaper reporter. Absolutely. What kind of student was Michael Wolff when we are talking, for example, about sex, drugs and rock and roll? You mean, did I have sex, do drugs, listen to rock and roll? All of the three. I did only one of them. Should I guess? Feel free. Sex? <laughs> I will just, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> That's poor sourcing. I think you need to give me more than that. Really? No, I mean, were you wild? What kind of student were you? I, you know, I was, uh, I, was a, I was a good student, for goodness sake. Jeez. Um, uh, I, I went to work at an early point. I, I, uh, when I was during my second year in in college, I got a job at the New York Times. As a copy boy? Yes. Um, and I was, um, and so I was working all the time. I, I mean, I, I think I've been working for the past uh, uh, 40 years. I haven't yet stopped soon. Really? Maybe I can retire on Donald Trump. <laughs> can I ask you the, the blunt question, what has he made you till now with, the, uh, with this book? He has made me tired. <laughs> I like more meant money-wise? I, you know, my, my credit cards are still overdrawn, so we're, we're, we're waiting to see what, um, what comes my way. Is it two million copies that have been sold? Yeah, you? yeah. So that's really good. It's extraordinary, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're going to ask people to ask questions here, but first of all, uh, we asked our correspondent in Washington, D.C., the Dutch correspondent for public television, to give a sort of biography of Michael Wolff. Here it is. Ja, Michael Wolf is een veelbesproken journalist, onder collega's zelfs een gehate journalist. We kennen hem vooral van bladen zoals Vanity Fair, een Hollywood Reporter en is ook een fervente boekenschrijver. Nou, hij betreedt wel een zijpaden in de politiek, maar hij is toch vooral de chroniqueur van de media-elite in Manhattan. Nou, dan wisselt hij soms uh, ja, diepe analyses af met toch meer lichte stukken, met een hoog roddel en entertainmentgehalte. En altijd in de stijl 
van de society pagina's van de New Yorkse tabloids. Tot Fire and Fury was The Man Who Owns the News over Rupert Murdoch. Zonder twijfel het bekendste boek van Michael Wolff. Van mijn gevoel wist hij hier de essentie van Rupert Murdoch te vatten. Wolff is geïnteresseerd in mannen met macht. En dan schrijft hij graag over hun geld, hun onzekerheden, hun ijdelheden. Er zijn zeker parallellen tussen Michael Wolff en Donald Trump. Uh, Wolf is soms wel eens de Trump van de journalistiek genoemd. Uh, beide komen uit New York. Uh, beide zijn ze niet vies van roddel en speculatie. Beide gaan niet het straatgevechten uit de weg. Hè. Ze zijn allebei vrij polemiserend. En daarom was het misschien wel zo passend dat het juist Wolf was die een boek schreef over Trump. Arjen van der Horst, our correspondent. Is he right? Is there other similarities between you and the president of the United States? Uh, there are no similarities whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, you both are from New York. Uh, we both are from New York, yes. Streetwise? Okay. It's, it's, um, um, but there are different kinds of New Yorks, and I'm not from his New York. You are from? Uh, well, the New York where we work, for one thing. Um, I mean, Donald Trump doesn't really work. Um, I mean, he never has really earned... Actually, he's probably... He probably has l less money now than he did when he first inherited his father's money. That's I not mean, what... he's a flim-flam man. Um, and I think everybody in New York knows this. For, for years, we, we all knew, especially journalists, that this was... Um, you know, Donald, Do Donald Trump was our local joke. Mm. How often did you bump into each other in restaurants or...? No, often. I mean, I was... I wrote a, a column about the media for New York Magazine, and he would call me up, you know, from time to time to complain about what was said about him, or often, more often, when something was not said about him and he felt that he, that he should be written about. Um, so we were... We had a, f a perfectly reasonable acquaintance. I would see him... Um, at, out at night. Donald Trump was literally out every night. There was not a party, not a, you know, he, he, would, he would go, as they say, to the um, opening of an envelope. Um, and, um, <laughs> um, and so you would, you, would, you would see him. He was just a New York fixture. Yeah. But what is the attraction for you to people like, men like Donald Trump with power? Like, I mean, you did the book on Rupert Murdoch. He's maybe the same kind of man. Why do you... You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm interested in people in the media business. I'm interested in people who succeed in the media business. Um, I'm interested in people who are larger than life. When I, when, I, when I decided to do this book about Donald Trump, I mean, it wasn't because, um, because he was the president, really, or because of his... You know, most people are... are are either for Donald Trump um, or against Donald Trump because of his politics. Um, that wasn't my interest. My interest was that he was... I just knew he was going to be an incredible story. Did you vote for him? I don't vote. Oh. Because? Because I'm a journalist, because it's... it's um, um, I, I, I find it... It's, it's, it's easier to take a step back and to and to look and listen without having, without committing yourself. Okay, let's see uh, if there are questions here in this hall in Carré. Please stand up if you have a question for Michael Wolf, and the microphone will come to you. Over there. Yeah. My question is, if, uh, if you weren't, wouldn't have been a journalist, what would you have voted? Well, geez, that's really... Uh, you really got to it. I would not have voted for Donald Trump. I would have voted for Hillary Clinton. Here. Um, hi. I was wondering, uh, mostly towards the end of the book, when I read that um, Donald Trump said his dad wasn't involved with the KKK, and then in, um, you said in, like, one sentence, yes, he was. And was it a conscious choice not to include any sources in the book, or why did you uh, choose not to cite your sources? You know, when you do these inside the White House books, and mine, mine is certainly not, not the first, you have to... you make a series of deals. Um, I mean, people in the White House obviously can't talk uh, openly um, about life in the White House. Um, so, um, I, so you make a deal, and it's a straightforward deal. I will, I will protect you. I will not reveal that you talk to me, and... Um, 
um, and you will tell me what she'll tell me, and I am then able to assemble a picture uh, of the White House. And as a reader, you have to, as a reader, you have to sort of decide, do you trust me or not trust me? All right, thank you. Did you tape those conversations? Do you have tapes of them? Some, 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 some not, but some yes, sure. Yeah, because that's the trouble, or that's what, what journalists said. Uh, we don't know exactly what source material he has, and we never so, know. Yeah, you know, you know. I mean, this is a, this is, uh, it's, it's absolutely true, and that's that's sort of the 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 foundation of you know the trade-off is you get to see inside the White House, but you have to trust me to give you the tour. Okay, here you go. I was wondering whether you have any predictions on the next couple of years of Trump's presidency, or whether he will even complete this term. What do you think? Uh, the, the next years will be bloody years. Um, and I think what you have right now is every, virtually every power center in the country coming after Donald Trump. Um, I think it's probably, it's unlikely, well, Steve Bannon's um, estimate, the way he handicaps this, and I think it's entirely reasonable, is that there's a, um, uh, a third of a chance that he'll be impeached, a third of a chance that he will, he will resign in the shadow of the 25th Amendment, which is about a president's disability, and a third of a chance that he will limp to the end of his term, but a 0% chance that he will get another term. Let's have a look at the impact of your book when it was published in January this year. West Wing drama. President Trump said to be furious over an explosive new book. An idiot surrounded by clowns. Clashing egos, betrayal and revenge. Dit boek sloeg meteen al in als een bom. En Michael Wolf had ook de mazzel dat ja, Trump heel hard naar hem uithaalde. En hij dreigde zelfs naar de rechter te stappen ja, om dat boek tegen te houden. Dus dat was echt een cadeau voor Michael Wolff en zijn uitgever natuurlijk. This is open political civil war now between the president of the United States and his former chief strategist Steve Bannon. De belangrijkste onthulling van het boek was toch een uitspraak van Steve Bannon. Hè? Steve Bannon is een stratege van Trump die ook een hele belangrijke rol speelde in de verkiezingscampagne. En Bannon beschuldigde de zoon van Trump en ook zijn schoonzoon van landverraad omdat ze een hele omstreden ontmoeting hadden gehad met een Russische advocaat tijdens de verkiezingscampagne. Trump was zo verbolgen over die conclusie van de boek dat hij mentaal ongeschikt was voor het presidentschap. Dat hij tijdens zijn jaarlijkse medische keuring een extra test had aangevraagd. Een soort van psychologische test. Nou, hij had alle vragen goed beantwoord. Was ook niet zo verwonderlijk, want dit is een test dat zelfs een kind van negen zou kunnen doen. Dan moet je bijvoorbeeld kiezen welk van deze drie plaatjes is een leeuw. Daarmee wilde hij dus aantonen dat hij wel degelijk mentaal geschikt was. Heeft dit boek het presidentschap van Trump in gevaar gebracht? Ik denk het niet. Ik denk dat het uiteindelijk niet zo schadelijk voor hem is geweest. Je zou zelfs kunnen beargumenteren dat dit zijn positie heeft versterkt. Want zelfs de grootste critici bij de Republikeinen, die steunen de president. En de aanhangers van Steve Bannon, ja, die lieten Bannon als een baksteen vallen. En ook zij schaarden zich achter de president. Dus zijn positie is er uiteindelijk beter om geworden. So he says that uh, for President Trump, this is a, a godsend, your book, because now he's rid of uh, Bannon and uh, he can go on with his presidency. Well, in fact, he's, he's rid of almost everybody in the White House. And I think that we're, we're heading to a moment when there will actually only be Donald Trump in the White House. Um, I mean, he can't hire anybody. Nobody will go to work there. Um, um, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's become, I mean, it's an extraordinarily toxic place, which is w strange because the white, working in the White House has always enhanced someone's career. But seriously, this... I mean, the, the presidency of the White House is a, is a magnet for people who want to work there. Maybe the quality is low, as you say, but he will never be alone in there. I, 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 I swear to you, they cannot hire anyone at this, this point. I mean, everybody is look. Everybody who has worked there is looking at a situation where once they're out, they they can't get another job. Plus, everybody, this Russian investigation hangs over over the head of everybody. So you go into the White House, that pretty much means that you're going to have to hire a lawyer, which is so very expensive. Even if you're innocent, it's going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars. 
over there. During the presidential campaign, I got the impression that Mr. Trump just wanted to become president, so just winning the elections instead of actually being the president. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I, I'll, make, I'll be more precise about this. During the, during the campaign, I asked him, I said, I said, because, you know, yeah, it was really true. Why was this guy running for president? I said, what's your goal here? And he said... Um, in a very straightforward way, without having, to, without having to think about it, he said, to be the most famous man in the world. Um, and I literally think that was his goal, a goal that he would have achieved, well, A, a goal that he has achieved, but that he would have achieved without, have, without becoming president, and he would have been a significantly happier man um, um, if he had just been the most famous man in the world rather than the most famous man in the world who has to also do the hardest job in the world. Over here. What's your response to the claim that you're a sensationalist writer? I'm, an, I'm a very good writer. Um, <laughs> um, sometimes we like a little sensation. Um, so I'm not sure exactly uh, television shows, there were like claims and like interviews in which they said you were like, something's, sometimes they doubt whether it were facts or rather like uh, propositions that, were, that couldn't be really proved. You know, I, I, think the, I think the issue is I am not a, um, I am not a Washington journalist. I am, not a, um, I am not a White House journalist, which is a very specific club. And I am very much outside that club and was very careful when I was doing this book not to be associated in any way with the White House press corps. Um, and, um, and so I think, you know, I think to some extent the res part of the response from journalists in Washington comes from the fact that I, I kind of stole the story. Um, Are you saying they were jealous? Yeah, you know, they're journalists. That's... That's, well, you are one that's, as well. Yes, so. that's what we do. Where, you know, if somebody else gets the story, you're not, you're not happy. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's true what he says, uh, the, the criticism of sensation. But is it factual? I mean, do you make your characters more sensational so we as a reader no, I, no, go quite, in there and think, the opposite. Oh, this is I make them, I make them truer. I make them people who you can understand. And that's, I think, one of the reasons this book has had has had a, such a, um, that people have responded it, to it so well. You know, you have a situation, Donald Trump, explain that. How do you explain how Donald Trump came into being? How do you explain what he's doing there? And I think, and I think everybody wants, everybody wants that explained. Everybody wants to get closer to that. And I think that I've succeeded in doing that better than daily journalists. Over there. I was wondering, from your point of view, what does it mean to have a president like Donald Trump for the position of the U.S. in the world? It's completely alarming. <laughs> I, I mean, this is, we're in this anomalous moment. Something has happened here that has never happened before. And it's, and it's almost like the, the, it's the opposite of logic. And, and that's almost the proposition. You know, we, for a generation or more, people have become disillusioned with politics and politicians. And here they were given the opportunity to vote for the exact opposite of that. There is nothing about Donald Trump has never been in politics. He has never held a job. He's never held public office. He doesn't really, he's not really interested in politics. He's not interested in policy. He knows nothing about, about any of these, these things, hasn't prepared in any way. Temperamentally, he's not like a politician. He is the exact opposite, and that's what people decided to vote for, as though this were a grand experiment. Now, I believe the effect of this is that people will decide the experiment has failed. Let's have a look um, at this presidency that has lasted for over a year now. What has it been and what has he accomplished? We will make America great again. It's going to be America first. We don't want them here. We only want to admit those into our country who will support our country. I'm you, not going to give you a can question. You can you stay categorical? You are fake news. Sir. 
The United States will withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord. I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. This is the capper because this is, again, the biggest tax cut, biggest reform of all time. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself. They will be met with fire and fury. Believe me, there's no collusion. Russia is fine. I did not collude with Russia. It was such a nothing. And I did not have communications with the Russians. No collusion, no obstruction. The presidency of Donald Trump. You say uh, he doesn't know what he is doing. People don't want to work for him. It will be bloody. At the same time, the people who voted for him are still there, and they are saying, hey, listen, the job market is up, salaries are going up, stock market went down for a little bit, it's coming back again. Economy does great. This, this person, this president, is doing a great job. What are you moaning about? You know, I, I mean, the, one of the interesting things is that, the, that, that this ought to be a moment for the President of the United States, an extraordinary moment, an extraordinary moment of great popularity. Um, so one, one of the things that you're looking at is this, is the stock market going up, the economy doing well, and the president's popularity still unable to climb above 40%. Um, so what you have, I think, is a, is a split country. I mean, in Steve Bannon's view, you have two countries now. Um, and two countries that are at war with each other, and one will win and the other will lose. And, and I, I, I think that that's kind of prophetic. Is that a war with words? Is that how it will be? Or do you think it could get serious? I, I, think, it's a war, I think it's a war with words, I, but it's, and it's a war with media, um, and it's a very modern war. And I, I don't know what, what turns that will take. Over there. So with American pride being such a big thing, I'm quite curious if, if you're proud to be an American, and if so, uh, until which extent has your pride been affected by seeing that a uh, president like Trump can reach the Oval Office? I, I am an American. I'm perfectly proud to be an American. Um, and um, um, Donald Trump is, is <laughs> you know, as, is as alarming to me, perhaps even more, because I've been closer, um, as it is to as it is to many people. I, I think Donald Trump is dangerous and I think he is um, um, as worrisome as it can be, but I do not think he is as dangerous or as worrisome, for instance, as George Bush. I don't think Donald Trump will take us into the wars that George Bush took us into. Why not? Why do you think that he will not go to war with North Korea, as he has said before? I, I'll, I'll, I'll be very honest, because, because going to war require, is very complicated and requires an, a longer attention span than Donald Trump has. <laughs> um, you did send some rockets into Syria, for example, so he has it in him to... He sent rockets into Syria because, not because of, the, because of the generals. Actually, it looked like he would not do that until it was his daughter who assembled these very big pictures of children with foam coming out of their mouths. Um, and it was those pictures that, um, um, that, that moved him. The victims of the attacks yes, with the, gas bombs. Yes, yeah. exactly. Were you in the White House when this was happening? I, I was. I, indeed, I was. Over here. Do you think that the photos from uh, the shooting in Florida will have any effect on him to push him towards gun control? I, I do not. And dis despite what he may be pushed to personally, and he's, you know, there are periods in his career when he's an advocate of gun control. But right now, one of the things about the Trump base is that, is that um, uh, uh, gun control or the lack of gun of controls on, on, on guns has become perhaps the premier, the central identity issue of, 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 this, of this base of voters. I mean, I, I, can, I can't be, even begin to explain why, but this is a, a hardcore reality of 
current American politics. This week in the White House, we saw um, the family members of uh, victims, of students who have been shot in Florida, and they had a chance to address their anger with the president, and he responded. Let's have a look. It, just, it doesn't make sense. Fix it. Should have been one school shooting, and we should have fixed it. And I'm pissed, because my daughter I'm not going to see again. She's not here. She's not here. She's at, in, in North Lauderdale at whatever it is, King David Cemetery. That's where I go to see my kid now. And it would be teachers and uh, coaches. If the coach had a firearm in his locker when he ran at this guy, that coach was very brave. Uh, saved a lot of lives, I suspect. But if he had a firearm, he wouldn't have had a run. He would have shot, and that would have been the end of it. And this would only be, obviously, for people that are very adept at handling a gun. And it would be, it's called concealed carry, where a teacher would have a concealed gun on them. Is this, you think, an improvisation of the president, or has this been prepared by his staff? Uh, this is an improvisation. I mean, it's, it's a moronic thing to say, and he's a moron. And, um, 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 and uh, you know, and, and, and it, it, it's, it's a curiously thing. He's desperately trying now, and this is, you, know, you can see the, the, the gears working, um, however clumsily, um, to come up with something in this, in, in a situation, in an indefensible situation. Um, but he's, he's stuck. He cannot get out of, of the compact he has made with his base of voters. He's locked. He's a prisoner. He's, he's locked in. Over there. Hello. Good evening. I wonder if you had any opinions about the role political satire was playing in the United States discourse right now on political issues. Yeah, I think it plays, I, I think it plays a big role. That, I mean, late night television is... Um, um, is, has now become a major source for news. Which one do you uh, watch? Which shows do you like? I don't watch television. <laughs> uh, <I'm... laughs> no, really? You don't I'm watch television? I'm too old for that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then maybe this is fresh material for you. We made a compilation of um, late night shows. Here they are. You know, Steve, I have to admit it. You did something amazing. You took the biggest long shot in history and you got him elected president. And you unleashed this monster of biblical proportions upon the universe. Michael Wolf, it's the sweetest thing anyone ever said to me. Thank you. Who's on the line? Hmm. Me, good morning, Ainsley, <laughs> Stephen Bryan. The President Trump. Thanks so much. Your show is so great. Huge ratings, of course, not as big as the ratings for my State of the Union speech, which was watched by 10 billion people, <laughs> including all of China. Uh, they say there's only seven billion people on Earth, so where the other three billion come from? Illegals. Illegals? I don't know. Um, did you like yourself as you, you were being portrayed in Saturday Night Live, as we see here? I, I did. I did. Yeah. I did. So you do watch television, well, admit it. Well, if I'm, yes, if I'm on it, I mean, um, <laughs> I, and actually, I didn't watch that, so it was in the morning, you know, and people started to send this, 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 this to me, and, and you're looking at this and you think, what, what is going on here? And then my daughter was, my two-year-old was, was in bed, and she said, that's my dad. Uh. <laughs> she didn't know that it wasn't you. Yeah, no. Let's go back to your book. Uh, we talked to two journalists in Washington, Eric Wempel, he's the media critic of the Washington Post, and also to David Korn, a senior political journalist in Washington. If you have a book on Donald Trump in January 2018 and you have Steve Bannon saying very, very kind of inflammatory things about Trump's family, inflammatory things about the Russia investigation, things tend to go kaboom. Uh, and that's what happened with Michael Wolff's book. He timed it. He could not have timed it more perfectly, and he deserves a lot of credit for that. I tip my hat to him for getting in there and getting Steve Bannon and other people on the record saying what they really think, and that's a tremendous act of journalism. Michael Wolf had a certain strategy for getting in the White House and for um, securing access, and that involved writing stories about the media and Trump that he thought, I think, uh, the White House would like. The assumption might have been 
within the White House that, you know, he will write something that we like. Um, if so, that was pretty idiotic on their part, given how chaotic and incompetent the administration has been in the you know in, the, in this first year. Well, I think that there have been several controversies around the book. You know, there are issues in terms of some small but not insignificant factual mistakes, in which he had n got names wrong and titles wrong, and that sort of you know sloppiness. Um, can sometimes take away from the credibility of a book. Now, is it about a woman? It is. Oh, it is? It is. Oh, it's somebody he's fucking now. It is. Oh. And it's... Who, who is he You fucking? just have to read oh, between please. the lines. People concluded that the president was having an affair with Nikki Haley, and I believe to this day he sticks to his point that I never said that, and just some reporter said that. I didn't say that. Well, he put two and two together, okay? He basically said that. He strongly suggested it. Um, and I think he should take ownership of that. Okay, so this is about Nikki Haley, who was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Uh, you, you made these remarks, as we just saw on the show of Bill Maher, that uh, somewhere in the book you didn't have the sources, but there is a suggestion that President Trump has an affair with a woman that he works with. Do you, uh, why did you make that statement? I, well, I didn't make a statement, uh, I, as we just, just uh, saw here. I don't know. You suggested I, that there was I something I don't going. know. Is, does it seem, do I think that the president is um, having an affair? Let's go over. The pre this president has spent his entire career, uh, it's the motivating force of his life, pursuing women. Um, um, we used to call it pursuing women. You could call it now harassing women. Um, he has been in the women business. He's, um, his beauty pageants, his modeling agencies. That, that's all known, but now you suggest on a show that he has an affair I'm with... I'm suggesting, uh, what I am suggesting is that it is unlikely that this behavior stopped at the White House door. That's not true, because in this um, uh, interview you said, well, you can find who it is towards the end of the book, and there you will find, between the lines, the person who he is having an affair with. You can, you can read what you want into this. Um, no, you said I this. do not, I, yes, I'm saying again, you can read what right. you want into this. I am also saying that if I knew, it would be in the book. It is not in the book. But for uh, people who are studying journalism here, because this is, a, this is the fine line between facts and gossip. What is the rule? What is the rule of Michael Wolff? Well, when you can thing, say something well, is well, true wait a or minute. suggested. Well, let's, let's get this between facts and gossip. First thing, gossip can often be facts. Gossip is the, um, is the currency that um, is one of the, the, the currencies of anybody's information life. What do you know? A lot of this is gossip. I'm not afraid of gossip. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm, I, I, like every other reporter, lives off of gossip. Okay, that let, let, gossip okay. is that, that I did not put this in the book cause, because I didn't know. No, I understand that, and you said that, but the thing is, well, let's have a look at how Nikki Haley responded. She, she is a woman who is married, has two kids, and she said this about your remark on the Bill Maher show. It amazes me what people will do and the lies they will say for money and power. Here you have a man who's basically saying, I've been spending a lot of time on Air Force One. I have literally been on Air Force One once, and there were several people in the room when I was there. He says that I'm talking a lot with the president um, in the Oval about my political future. I've never talked once to the president about my future, and I am never alone with him. It is absolutely not true. It is highly offensive, and it's disgusting. Not true, offensive, and disgusting. I, I, um, I, I absolutely disagree with this, that she has spent a lot of time talking about her political future with the president, that the people around the president have been um, deeply concerned, actually, that he would and that he still might make her the Secretary of State. And was she alone while having these conversations? I, I am, um, she was. But I'm sure you agree that this is something completely different than having an affair with somebody, so... And, and not, wait, let's stop this. I mean, you're the one who's pushing this now. 
I am the one who's saying that this was, that what is written in this book is about her bid to become the Secretary of State and her bid to inherit the Trump mantle. So therefore, let's not, I, I am not saying she had an affair with the President of the United States. I am saying she wants to be the, um, the Secretary of State and that people around her, uh, around the President, other people do not want her to be. Do you regret the remark that you made on this Bill Maher show because it led to a speculation about... I did not... For, for, I did not make any remark. I only said that I believe the president is, in all likelihood, is involved with someone. Um, 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 I, I, and that reflects what, that reflects the gossip in the White House. Um, um, and whether true or not, I don't know, which is why it is not in the book. Okay, last remark about this. Bill Maher says, oh my God, he's fucking somebody in the White House. Give us that line. What is between the lines, Michael? Tell us, and then you say yes. I, you can read, as I said, let's, let's go over this. I mean, you're, you're, you're not where you want it to be in this conversation. You want me to go somewhere, you're not getting me to go there, probably because you're not as good as Bill Maher. But, um, <laughs> but I will tell you, I will just, just clean this up, but we can make the thing. I do not know if the president is having an affair. Do I think he is? I think it's, it's would be, it would be unlikely that he is, that he is suddenly become a faithful husband. Um, um, yeah, in that event, I certainly don't know who he is having an affair with. I wish I did. If I did, it would be in the book. Here you go. So, uh, thank you, Michael, for this wonderful conversation. My question is, if you get one hour on record time with Donald Trump again, what would be your question? You know, one of, one of the things about, about Trump is very hard to ask a question because it's very hard to get an answer. Um, is it easy to ask for me now? The question would be to him from you, are you having an affair? <laughs> it wouldn't have, you know, the, the, the thing about, the, inter, the curious thing about, about talking to Trump is, number one, he doesn't listen to you. Um, so it really doesn't matter what questions you're, you're, you're asking him. He's virtually incoherent. From thought to thought, there, there's, there's no connection. From sentence to sentence, nothing ties them together. The repetitions go on and on and on. And so you come away from this kind of thing. I mean, I mean it's, you're, you're literally shaken. Some, yeah, over there. As a journalist myself, we both know that there is a responsibility to tell the truth, whether it makes great sales for your book or not. My question is, before in an interview, they said that some of your fact checking was a bit sloppy and some of the alleged incidents that happened were untrue. Are you relying upon the fact that this is a president who is easy to hate and who we don't actually believe most of the time is telling the truth? Um, I, again, I mean, there, there's um, the, the mistakes in the book are are um, are of the of the most trivial kind. Um, what, one of the things that's happened with this with this book is that it it has become in itself greater than a book, a political event. So the fact that um, that a Mark Berman and was mixed up with a Mike Berman is suddenly um, is suddenly an issue. Um, um, all books mix up Mike Berman and Mark Berman. Um, so I don't know. Everything in this book, it, to the best of my ability, is as is as um, um, is as is as true as I could, um, um, as I was able to. As true, I'm just going to say, as true as I could make it. But that would mean that I'm making up the truth. Um, um, you know, I was, for everything in this book, I, it, it rose to a level that I was comfortable with saying the overwhelming likelihood is that this is true. But implying that a woman is having an affair is not trivial because you're therefore actually implying her on a professional level and damaging her reputation. That's not trivial in my opinion. 
Did, did you just listen to this conversation before? Whether she's Republican or Democratic, implying that and ruining someone's professional reputation. Let for me book say sales this. Let me say this as as, as 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 directly as I can. Let's go right through uh, through the um, uh, um, um, anybody's thick skull. Um, um, I did not. I do not know who Donald Trump is having an affair with. Okay? <laughs> it's sufficient for you, the answer it's okay? Okay, <laughs> here we go. Hi, Michael. Before publishing the book, Donald Trump threatened to go to court. Uh, were there any other ways he or other people tried to influence or, let's say, persuade you not to publish the book or change parts of the book? Uh, no, it was just, just uh, Trump um, um, threatening to stop, to try to stop publication. So no money, no jobs, nothing? Like uh, no, just Trump trying to stop publication and then threatening to sue for defamation and invasion of privacy. Um, um, but we certainly ignored any effort to stop publication. In fact, moved the publication up. And, um, um, and Donald Trump is always threatening to sue someone. So I, <laughs> I, I don't get too riled up about that. OK. Um, there are great characters in your book. One of them is Anthony Scaramucci. Um, and um, he was, for only 10 days, he was the communications director in the White House. Now, we spoke to him as well. And he uses strong language in the interview. I was just wondering, should we uh, show you the edited version or the uncensored version? Well, I think we'd have to see. It's Anthony Scaramucci. Um, go for it. I call the book Liar and Furious. OK, so Liar is the ball guy. Michael Wolf, he's like a total liar. And Furious is Steve Bannon. I'm not Steve Bannon. No. I'm not trying to suck my own <laughs> I'm not trying to build my own brand off and strength the president. What I said about Steve Bannon holds true. All he cares about is his own personal brand and that he would diverge and break from the president. He would diverge and break from anybody if it didn't fit his personal needs or personal interests. And so the whole book is this whole nonsense around the narrative that he's the guru and that the president was his hand puppet. It's a bunch of nonsense. What was left out of Liar and Furious is that he was trying to suggest that I was like a hanger on at Trump Tower. I mean, he forgot the fact that I was named to the president's executive transition team on the Friday after the election. So the notion that I'm like sitting around waiting for a job and that I left the campaign after the Access Hollywood thing is a sign of how dishonest he is and how he doesn't check his sources. What Michael Wolff doesn't report in the book is that he campaigned tirelessly right up until the last moment. He flew from uh, Pennsylvania to Michigan, uh, maybe 20 hours left in the election or something like that. So to say that he didn't want to win is ridiculous. I mean, that's a, yeah, that's a, that's a cornerstone falsehood in the novel, I mean, the fictional novel that he's writing, okay? At the end of the day, Donald Trump wanted to win the presidency. I was there. Michael, congratulations on a best-selling book. You made yourself a lot of money, uh, but you furthered the dilapidation of your reputation as a complete dishonest loser. But since you got the money in your bank account, I guess that's part of the American capitalist system, so, so God bless you there. But I know you're a loser, and I know you have a hard time sleeping at night being a loser. Anthony Scaramucci. Anthony Scaramucci. I rest my case. <laughs> Why is he so angry, you think? Well, I don't think he's angry. I think he's just a guy trying to get a little attention. He's Anthony Scaramucci. He's, uh, you know, um, 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 you know, he's, uh, I, you know, I suppose that he still dreams that he will be called back to the White House by Donald Trump when it is true, when no one will work in the White House, there will be Anthony Scaramucci. I think it's quite possible. <laughs> there is a slight possibility, yes, you're yes. saying. Okay, a couple of more questions. American presidents, after their term in office, tend to fade quietly and elegantly into the background. 
and open a library and do something to try to make the world a better place. Do, do you have any, con do you dare think about what, a, what Donald Trump's retirement will look like? You know, I've never thought of it. It's a totally great question um, because he won't go quietly. Um, no matter what happens, um, if he's if he's impeached, if he's forced to resign, if um, if 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 he's if he's um, um, cornered and humiliated, he will find a way to declare victory. We will not be so easily rid of Donald Trump. Is there a possibility you um, did hours of interviews with him? Is there a possibility that someday he will call you? And he wants to talk to you again about the book. I, I think it's very likely that soon enough he will call me to claim credit for this book, yes. <laughs> and is it fair to say that he would be totally right? E uh, yes, yes. <laughs> um, I think it's been established here that a lot of people think there are many things wrong with your book. Um, do you... Um, stand by your work now or if you could would you change anything about the way you wrote it down or um... yeah, I, I, I wouldn't change anything and um, um, and in my defense I think a lot of people have um, um, have had a nice experience reading my book <laughs> we always end this show with what is your best advice for the students here in the hall and the people at home watching in the best advice for um, for a career in journalism, or or in life itself, or um, in television, what what's the um, direct me a bit? Life. <laughs> I, d I don't know. Work hard. Work hard. <laughs> Michael Wolf. Dat was het voor het college tour uh, dit seizoen. We zijn weer terug later dit jaar. Ontzettend bedankt thuis voor het kijken en jullie voor jullie mooie vragen. Thank you so much, Michael Wolf, for coming out to Amsterdam. Thank you. NTR, speciaal voor iedereen.